Hello and good evening everyone. It's a Friday evening and it's 8 p.m. UK time. So as always, it is time to start our IVF webinar. And today we have another special guest. And this uh, guest you probably actually know. We did a few webinars with uh, Dr. Harry Kamposis. So hello, Dr. Harry. How are you feeling tonight? Hello, Caroline. I'm feeling very well and I'm very glad to be here with you. And we are definitely excited to have you back. And of course, as always, so thank you already for joining our initiative, Stronger Together. Once again, it's good to see you for sure. And uh, as you know, this uh, event tonight is also uh, brought to you as just like our Greek um, day. Fridays are our Greek days, let's say. And as you know, we definitely want to um, let you know that Greece is the fertility destination of 2021. And also Dr. Harry Karpuzis is a partner on this. And of course, he is our special Greek expert tonight. So again, thank you for supporting this initiative, this fertility destination of 2021 Greece, of course, uh, as well. And uh, of course, remember that all those events have been brought to you thanks to our ambassadors and partners. And as always, you can see all of them right here. Uh, the People are definitely here more and more when it comes to those ambassadors. I'm very, very happy and excited that there are more uh, people involved with this. And that means that uh, we are definitely doing something good. So thank you so much for that. And uh, well, as you know, tonight we will start uh, with the presentation. And the topic for tonight is the endometrial factor and recurrent failures in IVF. So diagnosis and treatment options that will be uh, mentioned by Dr. Harry Karposis. And let me just mention that he is the scientific director and founder of Pelargos IVF, which is located in Athens in Greece. So I guess that will be it from me. And uh, Dr. Harry will start with his presentation. But remember that after the presentation, he will answer all of your questions so just go ahead, type those in in the chat section, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to assist you uh, with all the questions. And well, Dr. Harry, are you ready to begin with the presentation then? Yes, sure. I am. Uh, um, let me thank everybody from my behalf uh, to be here on a Friday evening. Uh, um, we will talk today about... Uh, um, I mean, recurrent failures in IVF uh, and uh, the role that the endometrial factor plays on that. Uh, we will discuss about the diagnosis of the endometrial factor and what exactly is happening and the treatment options for uh, its different uh, case. Um, first of all, uh, let's uh, start by saying that um, uh, the success of an IVF depends, of course, on the embryo. Uh, which is um, a, a very important factor, the quality of the embryo and the chromosomes of the embryo. Uh, but it also depends on the endometrium, on the lining of the womb, and it also depends on medical factors like the thyroid gland, like immunological uh, factors, like endometriosis. Uh, uh, as far as it regards uh, the endometrium, uh, uh, many times it's not uh, uh, taken that much into consideration uh, like uh, the egg and the embryo or the sperm, but it is uh, equally important. And um, uh, there are many proteins and molecules that play a role uh, to the implantation actually of the embryo and the way that this will be attached to the endometrium. Uh, but it's their coordinated um, uh, contribution actually, uh, which is uh, very poorly understood. Uh, nowadays, um, uh, molecular um, biochemistry and genetics uh, help us a lot uh, to um, understand a bit more uh, that. And we will talk about all those things uh, um, uh, in the following slides. Uh, first of all, when we talk about endometrial factor, uh, uh, the most common and the most easy to understand is uh, the anatomic factors. Uh, which means that if there is a polyp inside the endometrium, if there is a fibroid that is protruding inside the endometrium, if there is a septum, a congenital septum, or adhesions, which is called Assermans, uh, all those factors play a very important role uh, in the implantation of an embryo. To diagnose all those factors, there are many tests. Uh, 
the most important ones are uh, the 3D uh, ultrasound, uh, which is a non-invasive uh, procedure, and of course the hysteroscopy, which is an invasive procedure. Uh, it's diagnostic, but at the same time uh, can be used to treat as well. Uh, about polyps, uh, polyps are very common. It's 10% of the general female population. Uh, there is some research that shows that uh, they are more uh, um, frequent in women that have endometriosis, uh, and they can affect uh, uh, fertility, both spontaneous fertility and IVF uh, implantation of the embryo with different factors. For example, they can cause a mechanical interference with the trans sperm transport. Uh, they can be related to inflammation, and many times in a chronic infection, we know that we have a, a micropolypoidal uh, uh, morphology of the endometrium. Uh, they can cause mechanical interference with the implantation of the embryo, and uh, they can also uh, change, alter uh, the production of many endometrial receptive factors that play a role in the implantation uh, um, procedure. Um, how can we diagnose a polyp? Uh, with an ultrasound, uh, with a 3D ultrasound, which gives us an even better picture. Uh, with an HSG, which is a check uh, to check uh, a test to check the tubes and the inside of the womb, the lining of the womb. Uh, a high cosy, which is a similar one, uh, only with ultrasound and not uh, with uh, X-rays. Uh, when we have um, uh, doubts about uh, the presence of uh, of a polyp, uh, we may need to repeat the ultrasound in the beginning of the cycle uh, uh, when uh, the endometrium is uh, thinner. Uh, we may also need uh, to put some fluid inside, uh, which is an aqua scan or a hydrosono. And of course, uh, uh, the best way to identify it is a hysteroscopy. It can be either an outpatient one uh, or uh, uh, a normal one uh, in theaters uh, when uh, we also want uh, to uh, remove a polyp. Uh, there is data about polyps. I don't think that uh, it is very uh, significant to go through all that data. Uh, the general picture is that um, there is strong evidence uh, that the polyps uh, need to be removed uh, before uh, an embryo transfer uh, because this uh, increases uh, the implantation rates. Uh, uh, it also increases even the spontaneous conception and reduces the risk of miscarriage. Uh, one question is uh, what happens if a polyp is identified at the time of the IVF? at the time of the stimulation, uh, then uh, in most of the cases, it would be better to freeze and then transfer after we remove this polyp. Uh, regarding fibroids, fibroids are very common as well, are about three to 10% in women of reproductive age and in African origin women are even more commoner, uh, a lot commoner actually. Uh, the diagnosis happens again with ultrasound, with uh, 3D ultrasounds, with MRI, if there are a lot of fibroids and it is difficult to get a clear picture of where exactly each of the fibroid is located, because this is very significant as well. Uh, the fibroids, uh, generally the data and the research uh, says, uh, uh, and this is a, a recent one uh, that uh, fibroids that are close to the cavity interfere with the cavity or distort the cavity can be associated with recurrent miscarriages. And actually, eight, in some research, 8.2% of the women with recurrent mis miscarriages uh, uh, has got a fibroid which is uh, uh, close to the cavity and affects the cavity. Uh, regarding the fibroids, we've got, of course, uh, the fibroids that are protruding completely inside the cavity, and those are the submucosal ones. Uh, we've got those uh, that are inside the muscle of the womb, and they are the mural ones. And we've got these which are in the serosa, and they are the subserosal ones. Uh, the submucosal fibroids, there is clear evidence that they need to be removed before IVF because they can affect fertility. Uh, they can affect implantation rates. Uh, uh, and they can significantly reduce the outcomes according to several data. Uh, it is a bit more difficult to decide what we are doing on intramural and subserosal fibroids. Generally, uh, to my, uh, to our clinic, uh, uh, when there is a fibroid uh, which is less than uh, four or five centimeters in size and it is intramural, so it's not protruding inside the cavity, we do not remove them, at least in the first attempt of IVF. Uh, 
uh, because there is quite significant data that says that um, uh, maybe they don't play an important uh, uh, role. Uh, what's happening though if the fibroids are more than five, six centimeters, seven centimeters? Well, I would say that definitely if the fibroid is more than seven centimeters, it needs to be removed unless there is a very specific reason of not uh, doing that. For example, a medical reason uh, that affects the health of the woman. Um, and uh, about fibroids, five to seven centimeters, if we are talking about um, uh, a young age uh, uh, with no previous surgery and uh, without any other comorbidity factors, uh, uh, we prefer to remove them uh, because they can affect the blood uh, flow uh, to the endometrium, they can affect the contractility of the womb, so we prefer to remove these. Uh, uh, and there is some data again for that. Uh, what's happening, and this is the most difficult thing with uh, fibroids uh, that uh, slightly uh, are slightly protruding inside the cavity. There are fibroids that can start from the muscle of the womb and they can go more than 50% inside the cavity and uh, fibroids that uh, they are in the muscle of the womb and go less than 50% inside the cavity and um, there are fibroids that are just touching the cavity. Um, it's a difficult thing and it's a difficult decision. Uh, actually, fibroids that go more than 50%, uh, most of the data uh, says that it would be better to be removed. Uh, for fibroids uh, that are protruding less than 50% or are just touching the cavity, then the decision is more complex and we need to consider many factors. Is this the first IVF? Uh, uh, is there an age problem uh, that, uh, for example, a removal of a fibroid will delay the treatment and um, they will have uh, uh, an age limit or anything like that and the person will not be able to proceed in IVF, for example? Uh, are there many surgeries before? Uh, would it be easy to remove this fibroid without really compromising the endometrium and causing trauma to the endometrium? Uh, there are many things that need to be considered and each case is different. Uh, about uh, uh, cases like that, it would be very important to do a hysteroscopic assessment as well uh, and uh, uh, decide uh, and see exactly how much of the fibroid is going inside. Uh, definitely one of the things that we need to know as well is that if we have problems because of the fibroid to access the ovaries and uh, retrieve the eggs, uh, then uh, the answer is easy, then yes, we need uh, to operate. Um, what operation do we do for each of the fibroids? Um, if we are talking about some causal fibroids, then we are talking about a hysteroscopic removal. And if they are more than three centimeters in my uh, in our clinic, uh, we prefer to do GnRH analogs before so that we can reduce them a bit uh, uh, in size. Uh, so that we can remove them in one stage, because if they are too big, uh, maybe a second stage procedure would be needed. So GnRH help on avoiding that. In avoiding that, uh, of course, uh, before we give the GnRH analogs, uh, we need uh, to take into consideration other factors. That, uh, for example, if the EMH is low, the age is high, and uh, we are talking about a poor responder, it would be maybe better to retrieve first the eggs and then go ahead with the removal of the fibroids because the GnRH can down-regulate the ovaries and can make it more difficult to uh, stimulate them again after that. Uh, if we are talking about an intramural or a big uh, subserosal uh, fibroid, uh, the answer is easy, it's laparoscopic uh, removal. Uh, and if we are talking about more than 50% uh, submucosal, then a hysteroscopy can be done, but it needs to be done correctly without really compromising the endometrium because it is sometimes a difficult um, uh, technically uh, operation to remove a fibroid from uh, a, a hysteroscopy if it is going also inside the muscle of the womb. But there are special techniques uh, that uh, can be used to, um, to, to do that, to manage that. Uh, if we are talking more than 50%, uh, uh, sorry, less than 50%, it's wrong in the slide. Uh, uh, protruding inside the cavity, then maybe the best thing if we want to remove a fibroid would be to remove it with a laparoscopy and maybe combine it with a hysteroscopy as well and take good care so that the cavity is not breached. Uh, this is a fibroid in a hysteroscopy, some causal one. Uh, 
Uh, symptoms. Uh, symptoms most of the times is um, uh, congenital. Uh, of course, uh, they can affect the implantation with a mechanical way. Um, can it reduce the size of the cavity, uh, can affect the sperm transport, uh, can uh, be a consequence of uh, inflammation as well uh, and can be related to that. Uh, they increase the miscarriage rate uh, and uh, rate and in some uh, research uh, this uh, increase uh, can vary between 20 to 40 percent. Uh, they can cause preterm deliveries, increase the rate of cesarean section, breach positions of the babies. Uh, they can cause several things. Uh, it is very difficult sometimes to, um, uh, to find out if it is a septated uterus or a bicorneal uterus, and the management is completely different for each of that. And this is why we can use the 3D ultrasound, uh, MRI, HHG, uh, and of course uh, the hysteroscopy, which uh, would be the golden standard to find out what exactly is happening. So when we find the septum, what are we doing? Uh, uh, we can uh, remove it and we can use energy for that uh, with a special machine that is called rejectoscope. We can use scissors, we can use laser, we can use several things. Uh, if uh, uh, the IVF and the embryo transfer uh, is delayed after that, uh, then it would be preferable to cover with antibiotics, uh, uh, to do some hormonal treatment uh, with estrogen so that we can uh, uh, keep uh, the septum uh, from coming back, and sometimes we can also use uh, an intrauterine device. If uh, we are talking uh, about straight away to go for IVF, we don't use that, but we can use estrogen pretreatment, estrogen priming, so that uh, we can go ahead as soon as possible with uh, the IVF after the removal of the septum. Uh, what about adhesions, adhesions or Asserman syndrome? Uh, most of the times it is post-surgery. Infections can play a role as well and can cause adhesions. Uh, even tuberculosis can do uh, adhesions inside the, the endometrium. It's suspected by an ultrasound when uh, the lining of the womb is not increasing in size uh, or it doesn't look healthy. It's three laminar with three lines. Um, also, color dopplers help uh, uh, in finding out that there is no blood flow sometimes when the endometrium is not healthy. But of course, the golden standard is again hysteroscopy. It can cause infertility, it can cause recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, uh, preterm deliveries. Uh, it is very difficult to deal with, uh, and um, when we see it, we try to uh, separate the adhesions. We do that with hysteroscopic hysteolysis. Uh, uh, we can cover with antibiotics as well. Again, we can give some estrogen uh, if we delay the IVF treatment. We can put a coil so that it can keep it from coming back. Uh, there are several studies that talk about uh, the use of vitamin E or, or sildenafil, which is the Viagra. Uh, there is no clear evidence behind this. Uh, uh, the last thing that we can do with the endometrium, even after the adhesiolysis, is not uh, uh, increasing in size. Is uh, uh, using a growth factor, a uh, granulocyte colonizing uh, uh, factor, uh, which uh, can help sometimes in increases, uh, increasing the thickness, uh, but nothing guarantees that the endometrium will be healthy. So it is a very difficult situation that many, many times, even if we do a lot of things, we don't manage to achieve uh, uh, a pregnancy, and the last resort is surrogacy. Uh, what about thin endometrium? As I explained before, one of the most common reasons is Asserman syndrome. Uh, but what else? It can be an infection, either an acute one or a chronic infection. About uh, infections, yes, of course, uh, um, we can uh, take uh, the cultures, uh, vaginal and cervical cultures, which are not accurate. And uh, many of them, uh, uh, they don't uh, give us uh, uh, a normal result uh, of if something is happening inside the womb. Uh, they can show us about the vagina, they can show us about uh, the, the cervix, uh, but uh, not really of what exactly uh, is happening inside the endometrium, and especially if it is a chronic infection. Um, as I said before, that it can also even be associated with tuberculosis sometimes, the thin endometrium. Uh, now, uh, in many cases, it is uh, related uh, to medication as well, uh, like Clomid, for example, uh, which is a medication that we know that uh, reduces the thickness of uh, the womb. So if it does that, we need to change medication. Uh, 
but there are cases uh, that, uh, for example, uh, we don't have any past history of TOPs, of DNCs, of myomectomies, of infections, uh, and uh, still uh, the endometrium is not getting thicker than 7 uh, millimeter in an IVF. It's quite common, actually. Uh, and uh, in some research, uh, uh, actually, this is not only the thickness. In many times, most of the times, uh, uh, thin endometrium can be associated with poor granular uh, epithelium, uh, uh, with high resistance in the uterine blood flow, with uh, decreased uh, growth factors and cytokines. Uh, so it's related with other things that can affect uh, the implantation. Um, so what happens uh, actually, how thin is thin is the question. Uh, um, there is some data, it's a very well researched matter actually, uh, that says uh, that uh, the cutoff uh, uh, limit is seven millimeters uh, and we have a significant drop in the probability of pregnancy below that. Uh, for example, another research by El Tuki et al. Uh, showed that the ideal thickness uh, is between nine and 14. Uh, and uh, actually, when we compare that to seven to eight millimeters, we uh, can see that we have better pregnancy rates, uh, higher pregnancy rates. Uh, of course, uh, we need to know that pregnancy have been reported in uh, uh, endometrium thickness of less than that, even four uh, in the bibliography, but they are quite rare. And there is a significant um, drop uh, if the endometrium is not getting thick. Uh, of course, it's not only the thickness. Uh, there are other factors that need uh, to be um, taken into consideration as well. For example, uh, the look of the endometrium. Is it a trilaminar endometrium, uh, three lines? Uh, is it a hyperechoic one, uh, which is not uh, that good? Uh, and uh, uh, that, is there any blood flow inside uh, the endometrium or some endometrial? Uh, we can check that uh, with uh, color dopplers. Uh, uh, also with 3D ultrasound, we can check the endometrial volume. There is a lot of research uh, that shows that all these factors uh, can play a role. Uh, and um, if, for example, we don't have uh, an endometrial blood flow and we don't have uh, um, uh, a trilaminar endometrium, then the chances of success are getting uh, reduced. Um, we can see here what I'm talking about uh, endometrial uh, uh, blood flow. With a color Doppler, we can see that uh, uh, there is a uh, blood flow just surrounding the endometrium or a bit higher up the endometrium. And sometimes uh, there is no blood flow inside the endometrium. And in this case, the chances are getting much lower. Um, what we do when we have a thin endometrium? The first thing is to find out if there is an anatomical uh, reason, like Asserman's, like adhesions, for example. We use, of course, the hysteroscopy for that. Uh, and if uh, there are adhesions, as we said, uh, we can uh, uh, divide uh, the adhesions or it is related to a small septum that image in the ultrasound, then we can uh, divide that. Uh, uh, but uh, when we do the hysteroscopy many times, uh, it can also be associated with chronic endometritis. Uh, with a picture in the hysteroscopy that shows actually a chronic infection. Uh, as uh, I've said before, uh, the vaginal uh, uh, cervical cultures are not uh, very accurate uh, for finding out if there is an infection inside the endometrium. Uh, we can take endometrial cultures, this is possible, and we can do it either as an outpatient procedure or at the time of hysteroscopy. And there are some uh, recent tests that we will talk later uh, like, uh, for example, ERA test, uh, uh, and uh, in, com in combination with the ERA test, for example, the ALICE test, uh, which actually checks about chronic endometritis. Um, but hysteroscopy is a golden standard, and also a doctor needs to know how to evaluate the chronic endometritis because it's not easy. There are specific signs in the hysteroscopy that can show chronic endometritis, like hyperemia which means uh, that blood vessels inside, edema, which means thickness of uh, the endometrium, and sometimes micropolyps. Uh, and all those factors have a high sensitivity uh, and specificity and positive and negative predictive values of the hysteroscopy for all of the above uh, factors are the ones that you can see over here. Uh, what this actually means, so that you are not confused, is that uh, uh, 
it has a diagnostic accuracy of about 90.7%. And if we also see micropolyps inside, it further increases it. Uh, when we do histology, when we take a histology at the same time, uh, uh, in, in the data generally, about 63.7% uh, uh, of uh, uh, the cases that we have made the diagnosis with hysteroscopy are confirmed also with histology. And when we say histology, what do we mean? We mean uh, that we find leukocytes, uh, we find uh, specific things uh, that pathoanatomal anatomologists uh, will find out and uh, 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 will say that this is a chronic endometritis. Uh, you can see the pictures here. You can see the edema in the first picture. You can see blood vessels and the hyperemia in the second. These are typical pictures of uh, hist uh, of hysteroscopic diagnosis, diagnosis of chronic endometritis. Uh, what bacteria are the most common? Uh, uh, I mean, chlamydia, which is very well investigated, only uh, takes a small part of 2.7%. The most common are uh, Streptococcus, uh, E. coli, Enterococcus, Uroplasma. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we have special um, protocols uh, in our clinic for that. And uh, we give doxycycline for 14 days. Uh, if we have a culture that confirms that we are talking about a gram negative uh, uh, bacteria, then uh, we give uh, ciprofloxacin for 10 days. Uh, if it is a gram positive, it's augmenting amoxicillin plus uh, clavulanic for eight days. We can also many times use a combination of this if we don't have a diagnosis, uh, but we suspect highly a diagnosis. Uh, in many units, uh, uh, endometrial washes are used as well uh, with uh, um, data that is not uh, uh, very uh, well confirmed, that has an advantage from uh, the oral uh, use uh, of the antibiotics. Uh, and we have some cases, for example, that we have a negative uh, bacterial sample, but positive histological diagnostic, diagnosis. So what we do in this case, uh, in this case, we have protocols that we use uh, uh, intramuscular uh, cephalosporins and doxycycline and uh, tronidazole for 14 days. So antibiotics can help a lot uh, if we have a diagnosis of chronic arthritis. Herpes. Uh, I will talk here a bit about herpes uh, uh, because uh, actually it can affect the endometrium too. Uh, and there is some uh, data that says uh, that the presence of uh, HHV, uh, 6A uh, DNA, this is a herpes DNA in endometrial cells uh, uh, can uh, alter the hormonal environment. Actually, uh, there is data that shows that uh, uh, we have uh, higher estradiol uh, levels, uh, which are most probably favorable for the herpes to go there. And uh, also, when we have the specific herpes, uh, we have altered immune environment. Uh, natural killer cells, uh, some of the natural killer cells are getting lower, but they get higher activation. Uh, the IL-10 uh, is getting elevated and the TH1 to TH2 uh, ratio is increased. And we know that this uh, in the reproductive immunology, uh, it is associated with infertility. So many times uh, in our clinic, when we have unexplained problems of implantation, uh, even when we don't have uh, 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 a diagnosis of the herpes inside the endometrium, we give treatment uh, for herpes uh, and we have seen good results, uh, especially in uh, uh, women uh, that have a history of herpes. Uh, now, when everything else uh, is not uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, we don't have any other reason, uh, we can uh, say that uh, the thin endometrium, for example, is, uh, uh, is related uh, to medication. We know, for example, when we do a frozen embryo transfer that we don't downregulate, and the downregulation, and most of the times, doesn't play any role at all, but some people react bad to that. And we see that when uh, we don't use that the next time, the endometrial thickness is getting more. And then even estrogen, uh, progynova, uh, when uh, we increase it a lot, uh, it causes negative feedback from the pituitary. And this negative feedback, uh, the down regulation again, uh, can affect uh, uh, the endometrium. Uh, so also when uh, we 
start without down regulating first when we start just with estrogen we know that sometimes uh, uh, in uh, ovulation uh, can happen this can uh, uh, cause problems uh, in the implantation uh, we talked before about uh, clomid that affects the thickness so sometimes we need to change that to something else like letrazole for example uh, many times uh, when uh, uh, we go up to, to eight milligram of uh, of uh, estrogen of progynova uh, and it's not increasing more than seven millimeters we try to give some uh, uh, subdermal patches as well because sometimes people react better uh, to this rather than with the oral medication uh, but then again it's not getting higher than that sometimes and we don't have any obvious reason for that and we do a hysteroscopy and the hysteroscopy is normal uh, what are we doing uh, my personal opinion is that there is no point of increasing the estrogen more than uh, 8 milligrams. It doesn't offer anything uh, and it can also cause uh, problems because of that. Um, uh, in many cases, we need to go back and think about nature and uh, do a natural uh, uh, cycle tracking, uh, which means that uh, we observe in a natural cycle how uh, the endometrium is increasing. And we can see sometimes that the endometrium may increase uh, when the follicle the ovulation follicle gets more than 20, 23, 24, 25 uh, millimeters in size and not 18. And then we can achieve a good thickness. So there are some special protocols that we can use in cases like that, uh, going back to the natural. And we see that we have tried everything else. And when we try those back to the natural protocols, we can achieve an endometrium of at least eight millimeters when we don't have, of course, any other reasons. Uh, the growth, the uh, granulocyte uh, uh, colonization growth factor. Uh, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, it's a growth factor, actually. That uh, what it does, it increases the mesenchymal and hematopoietic stem cells, uh, which means that it causes um, a regeneration, actually, of uh, the endometrium. And uh, um, a glacier, NCA, uh, have uh, uh, collected quite a lot of data that can source improvement. When everything else has failed, um, uh, we can achieve uh, an improvement with the growth factor. And we use it in cases of very persistent uh, uh, endometrium that is not getting thicker before uh, we decide that uh, to go to surrogacy, for example. Um, of course, the endometrium, as we know, the, all of us, it's related to hormones, to steroids. And what are the hormones that it is related to? Actually, there are two hormones. It's estrogen and, pro, uh, and progesterone. Those two um, sometimes are enough for implantation. Uh, and we know that uh, we need to have good estrogen priming before we start the progesterone. And there is data that shows that the ideal one is 12 to 18 days of estrogen. Uh, we know uh, that less than nine days, and there is data for that, uh, it's not enough. So this is one other thing that has to do with the endometrium. We need to know that uh, we need to give at least nine days, 10, 11, 12, ideally, or more of uh, estrogen before we start the progesterone. And then we give the progesterone, and the progesterone prepares the endometrium for impl implantation. And um, uh, actually, the implantation happens about seven days after the trigger, after the ovulation. Uh, and this is the implantation window, which can vary about two days. Uh, the progesterone levels are very important as well before the embryo transfer. When we are talking about the frozen cycle, then uh, progesterone levels would be uh, ideally more than 12. Uh, and uh, in our clinic, we always check the progesterone levels before we build uh, uh, before uh, uh, the embryo transfer, because we can add additional progesterone. Sometimes the progesterone uh, is not uh, um, enough uh, and it's not very well absorbed to give it vaginally. So in this case, we can give it, uh, for example, intramuscularly. Uh, when we are talking about a fresh cycle, a fresh IVF cycle, then uh, uh, the progesterone uh, 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 can be increased because of uh, the stimulation, because of the estrogen, and especially in women with polycystic ovaries, for example, we very often have a progesterone at the day of the trigger of more than two nanograms per ml. And when we have that, then the solution is easy, freeze, freeze all.
uh, error test. Error test uh, was discovered actually in 2011, and actually what it does, it shows the implantation window, uh, which we discussed about before. This happens about eight to ten days post ovulation, and um, actually uh, it is a matter of molecular biology. Uh, that shows that it's a unique genomic signature, actually, of the endometrial receptivity. Um, and what it does, it's, it, it diagnoses, actually, the molecular status of the receptive endometrial. It analyzes a lot of genes uh, so that uh, we know for each person uh, if the endometrium is receptive after five days of progesterone before or more than that. It's pre-receptive or post-receptive. Uh, and of course, the ERA test is combined with the ALICE test, uh, uh, sometimes which uh, shows about chronic arthritis with the EMA test, which shows about the endometrial microbiome. There are tests that are based in molecular biology and uh, they are very uh, important in cases that we have unexplained failures before uh, without any other obvious reason uh, and with good embryos. And also it gives a very personalized transfer uh, to people, which is very important generally in, in IVF. Um, about endometriosis, uh, uh, the last thing that we will talk about. Endometriosis uh, uh, can affect the endometrium too. It causes a hostile environment that can affect implantation. It doesn't only affect the quality of the eggs. Uh, what is the solution on that? Uh, usually when we suspect endometriosis, it is uh, either good uh, to downregulate the ovaries and suppress the disease before the embryo transfer, or in some times even uh, operate uh, when we have uh, a severe uh, degree of uh, endometriosis. Now, this is a different question. When do we need to operate before the egg retrieval or after the egg retrieval? It depends on many factors. Uh, uh, um, the thing is that uh, before an embryo transfer, if we have frozen embryos, and usually in endometriosis in our clinic, we use frozen embryos, and there is a reason for that. We need to downregulate, we need to suppress the disease, we need to create a healthy environment before we do the transfer. And uh, to identify the endometriosis, we can do the laparos a laparoscopy, um, or sometimes there are some new tests as well, uh, like ERA test before that we were talking about, that identify a specific uh, um, uh, protein, uh, which is the BCLX6 uh, test, uh, which has shows, showed actually that the people that are positive for that are five times less likely to succeed in IVF. So when we do that, uh, without the need of a laparoscopy, we know that we have most probably endometriosis and we know that we need to suppress the ovaries before the transfer. So to finish, uh, the embryo uh, has been thoroughly investigated, but it's not the only factor. The endometrium can play a very important role as well. Uh, the whole process of implantation, implantation window, and uh, what hormones, receptors, cytokines, genes, proteins, all those things play a role. It's the coordination of them that actually makes the implantation happen. It's not completely understandable. The molecular biology and the genetics help a lot with the new tests to understand that. Uh, but there is a long way to go. Uh, the most important thing that we always say when we have our webinar is to have a personalized approach and uh, keep in mind that unexplained infertility is less and less unexplained nowadays. Thank you. so much harry again for an excellent explanation and providing so many details on our topic tonight and of course as you can see lots of questions are right here as well so i guess let's get to them all right okay. and uh, well already i would like to thank everyone for all of your questions and the first one is right here hi what do you mean with fibroid with more than 50 percent projection in cavity well, we have fibroids, as we said, that are intramural, uh, so they start from the muscle of the vein. Some of those fibroids can protrude inside the cavity, can be half of them inside the muscle of the woman, half of them go inside the cavity. Some of them are mostly inside the muscle of the woman, so this is less than 50% projection, and some of them are more than 50% inside the cavity, but they are not completely inside the cavity. So those fibroids, it's a difficult thing on, on how you, we remove them. Uh, hysteroscopically, laparoscopically, uh, that's what I mean. Okay, 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Next one is a bit of a longer question. Hi, doctor. Given that these days you have so many instruments and tests available, why the usual approach with many clinics is to wait for X number for of failures instead of test the patient for everything that might be an issue from the get-go. Thanks. Uh, how exactly age plays a role in fibroids and their removal? Is it only a question of not wasting time waiting for the uterus to be ready or there are other reasons? Yes, exactly. It's, uh, it's exactly that. Uh, um, I mean, uh, if there is a, a, a very poor responder with very low AMAs and uh, uh, close uh, to 40, 41, 42, uh, we understand that the laparoscopic removal of the fibroid would mean another six months before she tries. So uh, this uh, uh, affects the fertility in a very big degree after 40. We know that we have a very steep reduce in the fertility. So sometimes we need to evaluate all the factors and see, does it worth doing that for a fibroid which is intramural and it's not... Um, submucosal because with submucosal fibroids we have clear evidence so we need to take all the factors and this is what i mean with aids i don't mean uh, regarding the first question uh, well uh, uh, it's a difficult question uh, listen uh, all those tests are tests that uh, cost a lot of money you may need uh, to pay uh, another ivf uh, for example to do uh, all those tests and uh, we don't use them uh, for everyone. Uh, and one of the reasons is that, uh, and one of the reasons is that we are talking sometimes about invasive tests as well. And uh, uh, we don't do all those tests if uh, uh, we don't have any reason of suspecting that something is wrong. A, it increases a lot of the cost and B, uh, uh, it, some of those procedures, some of those tests uh, are uh, uh, invasive. Uh, we need to take biopsies, we need laparoscopies, hysteroscopies. Uh, so if we know that we have very good chances of about 74% of achieving the pregnancy, uh, then uh, I don't know if it would worth to do those tests for everybody. Uh, if we have an unexplained failure, uh, then yes, we need to take it uh, personalized and check about all those things. Of course, thank you so much once again for that. Um, next question is, could multiple small fibers near uterine, the lining be removed without affecting fertility? Yes, uh, I mean, they can removed, be removed without affecting fertility. Uh, generally, if uh, the surgery is done correctly, it doesn't affect the fertility. Uh, if we manage not to breach uh, uh, the cavity, um, then, uh, of course, there is no problem. The question is, do they need to be removed or not? As I've said, uh, for uh, fibroids small in size that are close to the cavity, it is a difficult uh, question to answer, and we need to take into consideration lots of factors. Um, if, if they are just touching the cavity without protruding, maybe I wouldn't remove them from uh, uh, the first uh, uh, IVF if I knew that the cavity inside is free and there are no fibroids uh, that are protruding inside that and it, it looks healthy. But uh, yes, they can be removed if the surgery is done correctly. All right, excellent. Once again, thank you so much for that clarification. Next question, could multiple uh, hysteroscopies damage the endometrium? No, hysteroscopies will not damage the endometrium. I mean, if they are associated, uh, if we are talking about invasive hysteroscopies, if we are talking about, for example, uh, adhesiolysis and removal of sub-causal um, fibroids again and again, uh, then uh, always there is a chance of uh, creating uh, a chronic endometritis and creating uh, some adhesions and some scar tissue. Again, it depends on the technique. Uh, it is very important uh, the laparoscopic, the endoscopic surgeon that do all those things to be good in his job. And not only that, but to know when to do what, because uh, reproductive medicine is a completely different thing rather than uh, treating for symptoms. Uh, uh, but hysteroscopy as Per se, I mean, uh, uh, just the diagnostic hysteroscopy will not affect uh, the, uh, and the, it will not cause damage to the endometrium. All right, and thank you once again for that. Mm, next question. So how do you see if the uterus is well vascularized and if the blood flow is not ideal, are there ways to improve this? 
Well, uh, it's a combination, as I've said. It's the thickness, it's the blood flow. If the thickness is okay and the endometrium is trilaminar, then uh, sometimes we don't even look for the blood flow. Uh, if the thickness is not ideal, then we need to check uh, to see if it is also combined with reduced blood flow or not. Uh, the blood flow is checked uh, with color Doppler, so with ultrasound. Uh, and if we find out that there's no uh, flow, no blood flow inside the endometrium, then uh, we suspect that something is wrong. So then uh, we need to go ahead with the hysteroscopy and see what's the reason that is causing that. And again, thank you so much for that explanation. Next question is a short one. Is there anything we can do to improve our endometrium before transfer? Uh, well, uh, we've, all, all those things that we are discussing are things uh, that we try to do to improve the endometrium. Uh, usually the endometrium doesn't need any improvement. Uh, it uh, goes thick by itself if everything is nice and everything is, uh, uh, is normal and we don't have any issues. Uh, in a normal, in a natural cycle, uh, or even uh, in uh, estrogen cycle, uh, hormonal cycle, the endometrium uh, will get thick uh, if it is normal. Uh, if there are problems with endometrium thickness, for example, all those things that we have discussed before, uh, to check with the hysteroscopy, the growth factor, uh, uh, some research talks about sildenafil, about Viagra, uh, all those things can affect, uh, but to be honest with you, endometrium is a very difficult factor to treat. Uh, and uh, most of those treatments do not have conclusive evidence behind them. But they have uh, important uh, evidence that uh, they may help. All right, again, thank you so much for this explanation once again. And uh, if there is a thick junctional zone in adenomyosis, how much of an impact would GnRH treatments have in reducing this making pregnancy possible? And in turn, how thin is it likely to need to be for success? Uh, lots of an impact. Okay, I think I have understood the question. Um, well, uh, GnRH uh, adenomyosis is, is a difficult thing as well, and uh, uh, adenomyosis most of the times cannot be operated. Um, so the only option sometimes it is to try and get it better with uh, GnRH. Many times they do not uh, help. Uh, I don't completely understand the thick junctional zone uh, uh, in adenomyosis uh, and how thin uh, is likely to be for success. I mean, in adenomyosis, you cannot really, um, uh, you know, judge uh, the excess of it from an ultrasound. Uh, I mean, what you can do when you suspect uh, endometrial uh, lesions as well is uh, uh, hysteroscopy and see if the endometrium is affected as well. And about adenomyosis, actually, you just try to downregulate for the embryo transfer. This may minimize a bit uh, the thickness of the muscle of the womb. Uh, you check with a hysteroscopy to make sure that you don't have any problems inside the, the endometrium. And this is uh, what uh, you can do. I, I wouldn't really give you a figure of how thin it needs to be the junctional zone. All right, I see. Thank you once more for this, then. And let's have a look, because there are more questions coming up. Do you have any views on taking prenatal vitamins before embryo transfer, and which ones, folate, for example, folate, are absolutely crucial for successful pregnancy and birth? Well, uh, first of all, every woman uh, that is trying for pregnancy needs folic acid to protect from mineral tubal uh, abnormalities of the baby. Uh, there are many in the market multivitamins uh, that, uh, for men and for women that uh, advertise that they can uh, in, uh, improve actually the quality of the eggs. Uh, not strong evidence behind them, but there are some vitamins that. Uh, uh, can be used, for example, for polycystic ovaries, specific for polycystic ovaries uh, uh, that they have inositol inside uh, or uh, for poor responders, uh, DHEA. Uh, um, there are many uh, in the market. Uh, and uh, depending on the case, uh, yes, uh, you don't have anything to lose by making sure that uh, you take a bit of vitamin D. 
taking folic acid, uh, uh, taking the rest of the ingredients uh, that uh, are needed so that uh, you can make sure that uh, you are well prepared for the embryo transfer. And vitamin E, for example, as well, uh, helps as well, according to some data. Well, okay, thank you so much for that then as well. Um, next question, let's have a look at this one. Um, so, sorry, it's right here. My last three forms of frozen embryo transfer on day 12 of taking estrogen, I have had bleeding and my endometrial thickness reduces twice. I have abandoned the cycle. Most recently we continued and had a transfer but have had a chemical miscarriage. Do you know a reason why I would keep bleeding at this point in the cycle and the effect it has? On the cycle? That's a very difficult uh, uh, question. Uh, we need to go through the whole uh, medical history. Uh, what I would do in your case actually is uh, I would uh, do a natural uh, cycle tracking. I would see what exactly is happening in the natural cycle. Um, uh, most of the times this is a matter of uterine uh, defect. Uh, uh, which means uh, progesterone uh, 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 progesterone related. Um, unless there is uh, a reason that is causing the bleeding. So one of the things that I would first check uh, is uh, that to make sure that you don't have polyp and adhesions or anything like that with hysteroscopy, make sure that everything is okay inside. Um, and then, uh, uh, depending on what exactly uh, is happening on the natural cycle, maybe I would try to do uh, a transfer on a natural uh, uh, cycle and not uh, a hormonal uh, cycle. Sometimes in cases like that, it's related just to, to that, uh, it can help. Okay, thank you once more for that. And could intramural fibers near the uterine lining grow fast with or after several stimulations? Well, uh, uh, fibroids are uh, estrogen related, so pregnancy can increase them because in pregnancy estrogen are increased. IVF increases the estrogen as well, so yes, uh, at the time of a stimulation can sometimes get uh, increased. Usually they are not increased a lot uh, and they go back to the normal after we start the hormones. Uh, but uh, sometimes we do see that uh, uh, we have an increase in their size, uh, but rarely something that really causes uh, problems. All right, wonderful. Once again, thanks for that. Next question is, is there a scientific correlation between vitamin D and size of fibroids, size redu reduction? Vitamin D size of fibroids, size reduction, not to my knowledge. All right, I see, of course, no problem. Thank you so much for that. Next question, would the accessor procedure affect the fertility? Accessor procedure? I'm not sure here as well, so if you can uh, explain what you mean by that, okay? That would be great. We will be able to go back to this uh sorry just let me know uh, so if you would like if you will be able to simply um mention what you mean we can go back to this one um in the meantime let's have a look at the next one so my clinic is adamant that progesterone measured in the blood is not indicate indicative of the progesterone in the uterus so they don't test for it should i insist they test uh, it's not, it's the uh, policy of its clinic. Uh, we do a lot of blood testing during our IVFs. And uh, um, so we check uh, a lot uh, at the time of the stimulation, uh, we check the progesterone levels as well. There is some uh, uh, data that shows that uh, there, we need to have uh, specific uh, levels. They are not completely indicative of the progesterone in uterus, that's true. Uh, but there is data that shows that if uh, the progesterone is less uh, uh, than a specific uh, uh, level, uh, the chances are getting less in a frozen cycle and it's higher from uh, a specific level uh, in a fresh cycle, the chances are reduced. So why not check? 
All right, I see. First, thank you so much. And actually, we have the follow-up from the previous patient in regards to mm -hmm. the Excessa procedure. So it's a minimally invasive same-day outpatient procedure that shrinks or completely eliminates fibroids from the USA. Okay. Um, same thing uh, that shrinks or completely eliminates. So what exactly do they do to them? What... Uh, 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 I mean, uh, you are not talking about embolization or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's laparoscopic. It's with laparoscopy, and how can they eliminate the fibroids? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not familiar actually with the access and procedure. To be honest with you. Of course, understood. And uh, remember that I will be able to, of course, simply forward this to Dr. Harry. I'm sure he will be able to just uh, check it. And there's a follow up as well. It uses a technology called radio frequency ablation. Okay, I see. And this is happening with laparoscopy as well. Uh, I cannot answer actually. I'm, we are not using it in our uh, uh, clinic, so uh, I don't have uh, any specific evidence uh, to talk to you about that. And you to... of course, that's totally understandable. So thank you for this. Um, is uh, do you think it's important to check the NK in the uterus before IVF? Uh, listen. Uh, uh... This is, again, a difficult question. Uh, um, yes, you could do it if we have uh, uh, recurrent uh, failures of uh, implantation. The thing is that reproductive immunology is um, a very complicated and difficult thing. Not all the people um, uh, know exactly uh, what's the, uh, the significance of each of those uh, factors. Uh, the thing is that uh, steroids uh, coverage, for example, which is a very cheap medication, uh, uh, together with a combination of lipid uh, infusion, but on a normal and on a nice protocol that uh, is given correctly, covers about 90% uh, uh, of the cases of uh, the immunological uh, factors that can affect the implantation. Uh, and it costs much less uh, than the testing. Uh, I mean, there is another 10% uh, that uh, may need uh, extra uh, treatments like uh, immunoglobin uh, infusion and things like that. Yes, it is a test uh, that uh, uh, can be used uh, if uh, uh, we are planning to properly evaluate it and properly give other treatments than uh, intralipid and steroids, because intralipid and steroids can be given even without the testing that costs a lot of money. All right, again, thank you so much for this. And a que few questions left. We will be slowly finishing. And let's have a look at the next question that we have. So is it necessary to re-biopsy following treatment for chronic endometritis? Uh, we don't regularly do it uh, uh, unless uh, uh, in uh, cases uh, uh, of... Uh, repeated uh, failure again but uh, uh, as an outpatient procedure you, we usually actually combine it with uh, a test which is called ALICE uh, which is the same like ERA test uh, so uh, the, the checking the, the, the biopsy can be taken either at the time of a hysteroscopy or uh, uh, as an outpatient procedure uh, if we do it at the time of a hysteroscopy we don't repeat the hysteroscopy but as an outpatient sample just uh, to make sure that uh, 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 it hasn't showed any histological uh, 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 signs again, yes, we can do it. The truth is that uh, uh, when we cover for the specific uh, uh, bacteria uh, with uh, the triple antibiotic or the specific antibiotic for uh, a specific period of time, we don't usually repeat uh, the test. We just give the antibiotics and we do the embryo transfer. Uh, in some cases that uh, we have again unexplained failure, then uh, we can check. All right, perfect. Again, thank you so much. And of course, there's a thank you from the patient for you. Mm -hmm. Next question is up as well, right here. In relation to herpes, is it possible to have it with no symptoms? I have a low uterine NK cell activity, but high activity in my blood. Would this indicate herpes? Uh, it, it doesn't go that, like that. It can be associated to many other things as well. It, 
good. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, uh, you may have uh, uh, a positive uh, herpes inside without really having symptoms of herpes outside. So it, it, it can happen. Uh, but it doesn't mean uh, uh, but it doesn't mean uh, that uh, it's related only to that. Uh, there's a, it, another one here it, as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, there are blood tests that you can do to see if uh, you are uh, uh, herpes. Uh, uh, I mean, if you have uh, immunity for herpes, if you had it in the past, uh, or if you had it. Uh, 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 now, uh, so there are antibodies that uh, you can check. Uh, but this is for the genital herpes, and this is for the herpes in uh, the lips. Uh, for the specific herpes, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, check specifically for that in uh, endometrial culture. And again, thank you so much for this explanation. And uh, next question is, can, can endometriosis affect the micro, not sure here, sorry, if the fallopian tube, just thinking about how I've had had a tubal ectopic with normal external appearance to fallopian tubes. Endometriosis can do many things. Uh, it can uh, uh, also affect the tubes, uh, either by distorting them with adhesions or anything like that, uh, but uh, it can cause a hostile environment as well. The tubes are uh, uh, patent. Uh, and they um, uh, communicate with the cavity, they communicate with the womb, and if there is endometriosis inside the cavity, this hostile environment can affect uh, the transfer of the sperm. And uh, anything that can uh, play with uh, uh, the tubes uh, can uh, cause an increase in the risk of an ectopic pregnancy. Again, thank you so much uh, for that. And can endometriosis affect uterine lining thickness? Uh, endometriosis uh, uh, can cause actually um, uh, increased uh, immunological activity, natural killer uh, uh, cells uh, uh, activation, uh, 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 inflammation uh, uh, inside the, the womb doesn't usually cause uh, uh, reduce. Uh, uh, uterine uh, uh, thickness, uh, unless uh, it is related as well uh, to some uh, surgery inside the, the cavity that can cause that as a medical consequence. All right, thanks a million for that one as well. And um, next question is, what are your thoughts on platelet-rich plasma infusions for chronically thin endometrium? Yeah, uh, there is some data for that as well. Uh, we, we, we use it as well, but uh, it's just that uh, that's why I didn't mention it in my uh, my presentation. Uh, in comparison to the CGSF uh, and the PRP, uh, the data and the evidence uh, uh, that I'm familiar with goes more towards the CGSF. And um, uh, we usually prefer it in comparison to the PRP, but uh, yes, uh, it can be used. Uh, and there is uh, research that shows that uh, can help not significant difference in comparison to the CGSF. Uh, all those two are uh, used as a last resort before uh, we go through surrogacy and things like that. So you can try it, yeah. All right, again, thanks for that. And next question is, does mild adenomyosis affect embryo implantation? If so, how much? And also, is it possible to treat adenomyosis? Adenomyosis is not treated, uh, it's not operated. Uh, um, down regulation with GnRH analogs uh, can help a bit to suppress the disease, uh, in quotes. Uh, usually mild adenomyosis uh, uh, does not affect embryo implantation, no. Uh, but uh, because many times it is associated to endometriosis as well, we have seen that uh, people that have adenomyosis have uh, comorbidity factor and add endometriosis as well, and endometriosis can affect it. Again, thank you for uh, this.
And uh, next question, a bit longer one, was that I had done uterine at artery embolization because of five centimeter fiber in the isthmic area of uterus. Uh, it caused me premature ovarian failure. Nothing happened to the fibro. What examination and tests you would recommend to be done concerning uterus before IVF with donor eggs or own eggs if I manage to grow those? Who's done yet a uterine because of uh, nothing happened to the fibro? But the uh, well, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly where is this uh, a fibroid and why a uterine embolization just for a five centimeter fibroid. Uh, usually, especially if you were planning to go ahead with your own egg embolization, can uh, affect uh, uh, your own eggs, can cause sometimes premature ovarian failure. So it's not uh, um, the best uh, thing for a five centimeter fibroid. Uh, if it is just a five centimeter fibroid that is not affecting the endometrium, I wouldn't really uh, do something, uh, to, you know, to, to, to remove it or anything like that. Uh, but uh, it depends where exactly is the location of it. A hysteroscopy to make sure that it doesn't affect uh, the cavity. If there are suspicions of that, is uh, something that can be done, and then you need to make a very good decision on uh, if you need to remove it or not. Uh, uh, if it doesn't affect uh, the endometrium and uh, uh, it's just five centimeters in uh, size, uh, uh, you could go ahead uh, with uh, a transfer without it. Understood. And as you can see, there's a follow up. I was having pain in my stomach. This is why it was done. Yeah, but I mean, why you didn't remove it with a laparoscopy if it was a five centimeter or a surgery and uh, you, you decided to go ahead with embolization? That was my question. Mm -hmm. Of course, understood. So we will go back to the um, question, of course, if you can give us uh -huh. the answer. And in the meantime, let's go ahead with the next one. What does it mean if endometrium shrinks during stimulation from 11 to 8 millimeters? Does that suggest overstimulation? Uh... Well, uh, it depends. Sometimes this happens uh, in uh, polycystic ovaries, yes. Sir. Uh, well, uh, if uh, or uh, the measurements were not uh, uh, exactly these, because uh, if you are talking about having an ovarian stimulation and then the endometrium was 11 and then 8, uh, uh, then maybe something has gone wrong uh, with uh, the protocol uh, or uh, the doses uh, or uh, uh, a premature ovulation, for example, has uh, happened. Uh, there could be many things. Um, a drop in the endometrium sometimes uh, uh, may uh, make us think about freezing the embryos if you had embryos in the past, in, in, in the end, and uh, uh, do the transfer in a frozen transfer after we uh, create a normal endometrium, which is increasing in thickness. All right, again, thank you so much for that. And of course, there's a thank you from um, the patient for you as well. Thanks, very helpful. And okay, let's go ahead with the next one. Again, there are a few questions left and I guess we will be finishing. Does endometrial hyperplasia affect embryo implantation? What treatment options do you recommend to cure endometrial hyperplasia? Well, uh, endometrial hyperplasia, uh, most of the times it's related to um, obesity, for example, and uh, increased uh, weight. Uh, uh, first of all, it is a histological diagnosis. Uh, we need to make sure that it is not associated with any atypia because it can be a precancerous uh, um, uh, lesion as well. So it depends if it's just a simple uh, endometrial hyperplasia, uh, sometimes you don't need uh, to do anything. If it is a complex uh, hyperplasia or uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, abnormal cells, for example, then uh, uh, myrina coil uh, uh, increased doses of progesterone uh, uh, and uh, even sometimes uh, thinking about the uh, removing of the whole situation of, of, of uh, uh, are things that uh, you can consider about. Now, uh, endometrial hyperplasia outside the stimulation 
uh, to affect the embryo implantation? No. If you are talking about the endometrium getting very, very thick uh, uh, at the time of the preparation of the tumor, then first of all, you need to make sure that there is not a polyp hidden, so a hysteroscopy to make sure that it's nothing like that. And the second thing is that if the endometrium gets more than uh, 15, 16 millimeters, there is uh, some research that shows that it can reduce uh, uh, the chances. Uh, the ideal thickness at the time of the stimulation is between 9 and 14. So I don't understand exactly if by saying endometrial hyperplasia you mean uh, increasing a lot uh, the endometrium at the time of the stimulation or having it as a histological diagnosis. Because this is a histological diagnosis that can be outside the fertility. And so understood. Once again, thank you for this. Um, next one is, I've heard that vitamin B6 is useful for uterine lining. Is that true? Well, uh, not uh, really to my knowledge uh, that it really, really can uh, make a significant uh, difference. All those vitamins are uh, uh, good uh, to be taken uh, before uh, the embryo transfer, but not from the other. So really having some conclusions that uh, the B6 uh, would uh, increase the lining. All right. Thank you. And um, what about ubiquinol 50 milligrams taken daily for more than three months? Does it improve the overall health before simulation? We give it. We give it to responders especially and uh, uh, women that have problems uh, with uh, quality of embryos uh, and uh, use it uh, um, there is some data that can help okay perfect thank you for confirming this um and next one sorry is right here it's better to take progesterone suppositories or injections in the u.s they always talk about those pio injections while in europe they seem to prefer suppos suppositories are these effective in the same way uh, the, the way of progesterone administration, it depends on every clinic. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, vaginal progesterone is not getting uh, absorbed in a balanced way sometimes. Uh, and uh, this uh, can uh, cause uh, issues uh, uh, with the levels of the progesterone. Uh, that's why we usually prefer in our clinic to give a higher dose of uh, progesterone so that we can sure that the levels are maintained because it doesn't always get absorbed qu uh, completely. On the other hand, the injections, it means that you need to have uh, injections daily, which is uh, not ideal because you have a lot of injections in IVF. Um, yeah, it have uh, a better sometimes pharmacokinetic uh, uh, with the levels of uh, the progesterone. Uh, you can use even a combination of those two. Um, sometimes we do use uh, uh, subcutaneous uh, progesterone in combination to vaginal one uh, so that uh, they can get from two roots and we don't have any issues of just choosing one of them. Perfect. Thank you once more for that. And of course, thank you from the patient for you right here. Next question is, so next month I am going to have frozen embryo transfer, natural cycle, have regular cycles and regular on ovulations, but my endometrium is usually thin, about seven millimeters what do you suggest is adding estrogen a good idea how many days and how much okay uh, yes uh, um, if uh, there is an issue with endometrium as well uh, the first uh, thing uh, first option would be to go on an estrogen uh, cycle uh, so that you can see that if an estrogen cycle you can see uh, and understand that now, if even with uh, uh, and um, with frozen cycle uh, and uh, hormonal uh, replacement, estrogen then does not go more uh, uh, seven millimeters. Then this is a different case, uh, and we can uh, think about going back to the natural thing. But the first option. To our clinic and to my beliefs, uh, it's uh, 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 a cycle with hormones. And again, thanks for this one as well. And I would like to know if a small polyp less than one centimeter would be eliminated with drug treatment. 
Uh, it's not guaranteed. You lose time. Uh, hysteroscopy is a very straightforward day case, actually. Um, so uh, sometimes with a high progesterone uh, treatment and uh, a period polyps can go, but uh, usually when it is a proper polyp, uh, uh, it's more difficult to go with uh, treatments and the easiest way to, to remove it is by doing hysteroscopy. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thanks for this one. And uh, well, next question is, is there any dietary change you'd recommend to help implantation? Someone with endometriosis would like to do everything I can. Um, healthy lifestyle, uh, um, antioxidants, uh, uh, vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, and uh, reducing smoking and uh, alcohol like everybody. Uh, it's equally important for uh, people with endometriosis uh, like everybody. Uh, it's not something uh, uh, really uh, proven uh, that uh, uh, can really affect significantly the chances of success uh, as far as it regards diet. All right, understood, of course. And we will, uh, there's another question about endometrium thickness. When should it be measured before or after ovulation? And if so, why? Well, we usually take it uh, 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 at the time of the trigger, at the time of uh, uh, ovulation uh, I mean in some cases uh, uh, there is a point of checking after that as well to see what uh, is happening if it is changing in pattern and things like that but uh, we usually check uh, on the day of the trigger um, the day of uh, the ovulation to see what's the thickness and, uh, this is the cutoff limit of uh, more than seven but ideally more than nine and the patient has had a, I will have donor eggs IVF. For, uh, sorry, confused now. Who, uh, about what question was that? This one, sorry, endometrial thickness. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so most probably if you are having egg donation treatment, you will not have um, ovulation. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, just uh, build the lining of the womb uh, so that you prevent ovulation. And you either do that with down regulating with GnRH analogs or straight uh, with uh, uh, estrogen uh, pills. And the estrogen pills prevent you from having ovulation. So we don't want you to have ovulation. Uh, so we check uh, about uh, 12, 13, 14 days after the beginning of the pills uh, to see uh, what's endometrial thickness, and then you start the progesterone to have the uh, embryo cancer. All right, so well understood, of course, as well. And there are like two questions, and we will be finishing. So the question is, what treatment is there for an immune response to embryo, embryo implantation? I have an autoimmune condition related to my skin. Noticed I had a reaction. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, as I've said before, it, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, an immune condition uh, would mean uh, an immune condition in uh, the endometrium as well. Uh, there are immune therapies like uh, steroids, uh, like uh, uh, intralipid, immunoglobin, placanil, many medications that can be used depending on uh, the case and depending on uh, natural killer cells, toxicity. Uh, TH1 uh, to TH2 ratio and other uh, tests. Uh, you can check if you want and if you are, uh, if there is a reason of uh, uh, suspecting immunological uh, issue, uh, issue, you can check about all those tests and depending on the result, you can decide on the treatment. And amazing again. Thank you so much for your thorough explanation. And next question will be our last final question. So that is what would be the most imperative vitamin to take <laughs> in pregnancy? Well, the only vitamin that it's clear, clear uh, evidence that uh, every woman that is trying for uh, pregnancy needs to take it is uh, folic acid. So folic acid is something that you need before pregnancy, after pregnancy. 
and then depending on uh, uh, the recent data, vitamin D is uh, quite important. Uh, and amazing thank you so much and as you can see there are plenty plenty of comments and thank yous coming up so i definitely want you to see uh please do give dr hauser here thanks for his time he clearly is very knowledgeable there's another one this has been excellent and of course amazing presentation super helpful thank you very much for your time clear explanation so yes i can only add thank you thank you thank you a lot dr harry it's always always great to have you thank you you're for all welcome, the you're welcome. Uh, I'm, answers and uh, I'm, I'm 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 glad that uh, i've helped if i helped and uh, uh, i'll be happy to to be again with you i don't know when is the next one now i don't remember <laughs> <laughs> of course but yes i'm sure that you will get back to us very very soon so mm. i'm really already looking forward i believe it's two in two weeks time but forgive me i don't exactly remember <laughs> as well but don't worry dr harry will be back with us so you will have another chance to ask him some questions and of course remember that you can get in touch with him using this link i have just sent to you so if you'd like to get some more details or get a consultation this is the way to do it go ahead and do it and uh, well remember it has been recorded so of course if you missed any parts of it or you would like to simply re-watch this it's possible it will be available on my ivfances.com and of course on our youtube channel so i can only encourage you to subscribe and uh, well everyone have a lovely and uh, restful weekend and of course dr harry you as well I hope you Thank will you. have uh, you know, some time off everybody, as uh, well. Exactly. Nice and, and of course, remember that we will be back here tomorrow. Uh, sorry, not tomorrow. We see, I always forget uh, not tomorrow, but don't worry. We'll be back on Monday. So thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.